Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to show you a 2016 American psychological horror thriller film titled Split. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. An aloof girl named Casey sits blankly in a restaurant for her classmate's birthday. After the party, the birthday girl, Claire, tells her father that it was tormenting that she had to invite her out of mercy. Casey boringly calls her guardians on her phone to pick her up from the restaurant. Casey doesn't belong to any circle because she was detached and troublesome. She had no one else to go home with. Claire's father ignores his daughter's sentiment and waits if Casey can ride home along with her guardians. Unfortunately, her guardian's car broke down. She has decided to take the bus, but Claire's kind father insists on driving her home instead. Claire and Casey board the car along with Marcia, Claire's best friend. Casey sits next to the driver's seat while the two girls chit-chat their way to the backseat. Claire's father stops for the car's compartment and unloads packs of food and gifts when an unknown person approaches him. The compartment is closed with a loud thud, and a different man climbs into the driver's seat. The confused and suspecting Casey stares nervously at the man. It wasn't Claire's dad. Claire stalls the man by telling him that he got in the wrong car. Casey freezes when the man wears a face mask and sprays a substance to Claire and Marcia. The two girls have been knocked out of consciousness. Casey tries to obliviously break free, but the man knocks her out swiftly before she could. Casey redeems her consciousness in a room with a few rays of light. Claire is cowardly embracing Marcia. Before they could even engage in a sensible conversation, the sole door in the room opens. A man with an eyeglass and a sleek look enters and takes Marcia with him. After a brief while, he brings back the crying Marcia and angrily grunts while closing the door. Marcia briefs Claire and Casey that Dennis wanted her to dance for him, but she peed on herself. As Claire reassures the two others that they're all going to be okay, a traumatized Casey shakes as she storms off to a distant childhood memory. A bulky man named Uncle John was telling a hunting tale to a little Casey in a restaurant. She was with her father that day, and she thought nothing could go wrong. Meanwhile, in a psychotherapy clinic, the news of the three teenagers' abduction breaks out. An old psychotherapist named Karen draws to her computer and sees that a patient named Barry books an appointment to see her. In isolation, Claire is urging Marcia and Casey to fight back if their kidnapper attempts to lay hold on one of them again. Casey is thinking rationally and carefully and denies Claire's solution to the predicament. Claire thinks they are running out of time, so the three must make a painful move towards Dennis. Apparently, Claire assumes that Casey was troublesome and resistant again, given their situation. Because they still don't know what the circumstances are, Casey reassures them that she will help them out after a thorough conception of the solution. The little Casey was in a tent in the middle of the woods. Her father was with her, holding a gun and teaching her how to hunt her victim. In Dr. Karen's clinic, a man wearing a bonnet and a loose coat appears with a respectful knock. Barry tells her that he had a fashion inspiration. Dr. Karen flips through the colorful pages of his illustrations. She tries to vibe, asking him leading questions to uncover the character behind his lines. She tells a lie about his workplace, but he stalls her by faking a worrying sentiment. The loose and spontaneous Barry starts acknowledging some sign of a personality shift when he moved Karen's stuff into the proper spaces and left his sketches carelessly. He steers clear from Dr. Karen's clinic. The girls are still prying on the door's small space and capture that a lady was staying with their abductor. The lady was talking to Dennis, which the girls think was their abductor's name. The lady draws closer to the door and opens it. It was their abductor wearing a tight red turtleneck, a long skirt and heels. The flabbergasted teenagers step back slowly, all of them confused as to why he was in a lady's disguise. The lady reassures them that there was nothing to worry about because Dennis listens very well to her. She claims that Dennis is neither going to malign nor assault them and shuts the door close. Dr. Karen meets with a colleague doctor in town and discusses the pieces of evidence of dissociative identity disorder. The colleague doctor believes Karen's patients are not cut out of the normal, but Karen perceives them differently. In their windowless room, Marcia and Claire figure out that Dennis is having an entire conversation with a make-believe character. While discussing, a man enters their bathroom with a pail. He rants how dirty the bathroom was and asks them to draw close and clean it. He reassures the girls that he will no longer touch any of them as he agreed with Patricia. However, he mentions that they will be a sacred feast and leaves them wondering who is going to consume the three of them. Later that night, Claire and Marcia disturb Casey from slumber and points towards the door. There appears the abductor in a yellow windbreaker, sitting happily in the open door. It was Hedwig, Dennis' nine-year-old playful and childish identity. He repetitively warns them that someone is on the move. By this time, they already knew that their abductor wasn't faking out his characters. 
The girls notice how submissive and gullible he is, and asks him questions to find leads. Casey befriends him and asks him to come close so she could whisper through his ear clearly. Casey tries to reverse engineer the situation with Hedwig, but the playful identity believes she was lying outright. He innocently reveals that Dennis had been stalking Marcia and Claire for days, and he planned the abduction for a long time. Casey fibs that Patricia and Dennis were lying to him and were planning to send Hedwig instead for the sacred feast. She calculatingly convinces him that the girls in the room are Hedwig's babysitters who are willing to protect him from Patricia and Dennis, but he needs to teach them the way out immediately so they could save him too. The cynical Hedwig shifts his pace back to the door and closes it. As Casey peeks through the cracks, she gets a view of Hedwig fumbling to unlock the second door. The girls start knocking the drywall across the entire room. Claire finds a weak spot in the ceiling and tears the ceiling apart with her heels. Hedwig returns to the room and demands the girls to let him in. Claire uninstalls a portion of the steel grid on the ceiling while the two budges the door against the angry Hedwig. Hedwig changes into Dennis and opens the door with all his might. Claire climbs up and navigates the way across the ceiling, where a shouting Dennis screams and chase for her. She hides in a locker carefully, but Dennis finds her and demands her to step out of the vault. He asks her to undo her sweaters and takes her to a separate room which he carefully locked. He returns to Marsha and Casey's room and repairs the ceiling, warning them that Claire will be locked away from them. He also demands them to undress their skirts and sweaters. Meanwhile, Dr. Karen is doing a video conference with his fellow psychotherapists from Paris. She discusses the clinical evidence among her patients with dissociative identity disorder in the realm of possibilities of unlocking all the identities that the brain can possess. After the conference, Barry pays her a visit, but she quickly discerns that he was in a different persona. Dr. Karen tricks him that she wanted to talk to his other personalities, but Barry rebuffs. She guesses that it was Dennis taking over Barry's clothing. Barry reiterates that neither Dennis nor Patricia is taking over him because they are unstable and not allowed to exhibit themselves in public. Barry is getting frustrated while Karen is challenging him. After the session, Dr. Karen checks over the CCTV and conceives that Dennis or Patricia was really doing an act while taking over Barry's identity. Marcia figures out that they need to find an escape route while they are still alive. While she is talking, Casey dozes off in a trance of the little Casey on a hunting trip with her father and Uncle John. His father just killed a deer in the forest. Patricia feeds and grooms Casey and Marcia. She invites them out for a proper meal in the kitchen because they were good girls, unlike the isolated Claire. While Patricia prepares the meal, Marcia makes a daring move to slam Patricia with a stool. Dennis takes over and demands Casey to lock herself in the room and finds the trembling Marcia. He locks her to a separate room as a punishment. Dennis warns Casey that the beast is coming to feast on them. On another hunting trip, the little Casey was staring into the woods while her father was taking a nap. Her uncle John holds a gun in front of the innocent child. Casey wakes up with Hedwig embracing her from behind. Hedwig reveals that Barry and Patricia decide who stay in the light, but Hedwig is different. He also says that only Patricia and Dennis believe in the existence of the beast. Unsure of who the beast is and what it truly was, Casey asks him if he has ever seen the beast. Hedwig diverts her attention by asking permission to kiss her. She awkwardly permits him. After agreeing that he was a good kisser, she asks him if Hedwig could sneak her up to his room where they could dance and listen to music. But Hedwig leaves for Barry's appointment with Dr. Karen. During the session, Dr. Karen talks to Dennis instead of Barry, insinuating that his beliefs are absurd, just like what Barry reported in the previous sessions. She compliments Dennis to make him trust her. She discloses that if Dennis does not open up, all the other identities will eventually take over the light all at once. Dennis opens up that he and Patricia were ridiculed by all the 22 different identities. The reason why he was changing acts deliberately is to protect the weak Kevin. She challenges him to tell the Beast's story, which she believes to be just Dennis and Patricia's fantasy. After the session, Hedwig takes Casey to his room, where she hesitantly enters. Hedwig insanely dances to the loud, booming noise from the stereo. After dancing, he points towards his sketched window and accuses Casey of leaving through it. Hedwig hands Casey a walkie-talkie from Dennis. Casey dials in and reports the situation to the man answering the recipient walkie-talkie, but Hedwig takes back the walkie-talkie. He escorts Casey to her room. Dennis appears in his usual formal wear and eyeglasses. He explains that the beast is going to be pleased once the night is over. Uncle John was hiding behind a big rock and calls the little Casey, who was walking in the forest without his father. He was on his birth suit and asks Casey to undress, teaching her that they were playing animal roles who had no clothes on. When he was done, Casey waited just above his hideout, holding a rifle. Casey loaded it and aimed it at Uncle John, who quickly pulled it from her for safety. 
In the middle of the evening, Dr. Karen visits Dennis in his house. Dennis takes her to Barry's room and starts spilling out the familiar tale of Kevin's traumatizing childhood. Dennis came to Kevin's salvage to please his mother with organization and accuracy. Dr. Karen dispels his fears by convincing him that Kevin can be rescued in other ways without the 23 different personalities. Dennis puts her off by depicting the beast's resemblance. Dr. Karen mentions the beast feasting on the impure young women, but Dennis is hesitant to elaborate. Unprepared and scared, Dr. Karen halts the conversation for a proper session. She leaves for the bathroom and surveys the rooms across the hallway. She finds Claire in one of his rooms, but he wings her off using a toxic spray. Casey strives to unlock the door from the insides while the two others buy time to get themselves freed. Dennis goes to a mall for a bouquet of flowers. While he is on his way home, Casey gets into a room with a computer, where she discovers all the videos of the 23 distinct identities. Dennis rides into an abandoned train car, where he transformed into the 24th identity. He grows taller and bulkier, and he also moves wilder than any of the 23 personalities. He sprints home as the dreaded beast. Karen wakes up and writes down notes at one of his tables. She takes a bread knife with blurred vision and stabs him from behind, but the blade splits into pieces. The beast squashes the crying doctor to death. After watching the videos, Casey figures out the location of the keys and hovers silently around the hallways to search for Marsha and Claire. Marsha has already been wrenched with blood in one of the rooms. Claire was alive in one of the rooms, but the beast drags her and consumes her organs. Casey finds a note from Karen but gets stalled in horror when the beast starts crawling the wall. The crooked letters read. Say his name. Kevin Wendell Crumb. She begins muttering his name repetitively, getting louder each time she sees him weaken. Kevin. The original identity, takes over the body as he remembers how his abusive mother call him out with a whip. Kevin has no awareness of what the other identities did. Kevin begs Casey to shoot him with a gun in the cabinet but stops her briefly. Casey witnesses how the kind Kevin shifts to all the significant identities at once. While Hedwig is in the light, Casey searches for the gun. Casey realizes he's going to transform into the beast soon, so she runs across the rooms and probes for bullets. The beast has already changed, and before Casey could load all the shells, the beast grabs her and rips her sweater apart. She redeems the gun from the floor and stands back up to lock the cage. With wounded calves, she drags herself to the farther corner of the cell. Little Casey was sitting quietly when Uncle John appeared from behind. It was her father's funeral, Uncle John promised her that he will take good care of her. She aims at the beast, who is moving swiftly in the dark alley. Just like how she was taught to hunt, she fires at the beast. With only two bullets in her gun, Casey soon realizes that the beast is invincible. The beast warps the bars with his bare hands, but he gets a view of the scars on her body. With Casey's purity, the beast steps back to leave her alone. Later on, a man comes to the basement and notices Casey's figure in the cage. He assists her away from the zoo's main enclosure. While a medical officer attends to Casey, the policeman probe Kevin's possession in the basement. Kevin gets into an abandoned room, with all the significant identities taking over the light at once. They are assessing Kevin's body with the evidence of the beast's invincibility. A news anchor breaks out the awful news of the three cases of murder of Kevin Crum in the zoo's basement. The world of skeptical people has now been made aware that the dissociative identity disorder really exists. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.